What's up, guys? Ron from Ron Rory Law, and today we're sitting down with Chad Griffiths, who is an amazing industrial expert. He's an industrial investor as well as a commercial broker. And so in this video, we're going to talk about when do you sell your industrial real estate? So, Chad, thanks for thanks for joining today. Always a pleasure to chat with you, Ron. Glad to be here. And I think that it's a really important question because people don't know. People may have reasons to buy industrial real estate, and that's for cash flow, appreciation. But how do you know when is the right time to sell? Yeah, and I think the best answer that I could give to that, speaking somewhat generically, is that it's going to be dependent on every single person. And it's going to be dependent on every single property. Uh, I've got a number of properties that that I co-own with a few uh, partners, and we look at every one of those individual properties separate from one another. And I think that that's responsible approach to take that that investors should look at is what's your situation do you need the money do you need to sell the property and then what does that individual property if you have more than one how does that reflect your overall portfolio and what your long-term outlook is myself personally i try to buy every property thinking that i can hold it for 20 30 years essentially forever perhaps someone approaches you with an unsolicited offer to purchase and it makes sense for you to sell because you can take that money and use it for something else. I th it's very difficult to give a blanket statement that now is the right time to sell or five years might be an optimal time to sell because there's so much fluidity in the market. Uh, that, and, and this is one of the reasons that I stress that anybody that's invested in industrial real estate has to have their finger on the pulse of what's happening because it's not as easy to figure out is the say residential market or the multifamily market where there's so much data and there's so much statistics and and for the most part a lot of those properties are fairly uniform a you know, multifamily property in dallas is going to be very similar to a multifamily property in chicago that's not the same in industrial you can have two industrial properties side by side which are completely different so it really does take an investor just to fully understand their property the market as a whole, and then what their individual plans and ideas are for that specific property and make a decision accordingly. I think there are two main schools of thought. If you're an investor, you, you're you a forever hold and it um, you know allows you to eliminate some of the distraction. It makes it easier when you're making choices about common area improvements or tenant selection because you're a forever hold you don't care what the next buyer wants or what what the next uh, you know if it's a good investment or not. You just say if I'm going to hold this thing forever, this is the type of improvement and the the money that I'm going to sink into my property because I'm going to hold it forever. Contrast to I'll say the other school of thought is we have a pro forma, we have a value add plan, or at least we have some some valuation that if we get this money, we're going to sell. Uh, and whether you have investors or partners. It's all about kind of creating a timed plan. And um, when do you sell becomes, well, if we get our number, we sell whether we've owned the property for six months or we've owned it for four years. I, I think that's a brilliant way of looking at it. Yeah. One, one other thing, as you were just talking about that, that came to mind, and it's a, a property that we bought uh, last year winter uh we bought a, a fairly large manufacturing property from a institutional owner they actually had a sunset clause in their agreement so they had bought that property 10 years ago they had a sunset clause in that fund that they had to sell it within 10 years and they were up against that that deadline so sometimes it might even in those partnership arrangements it becomes even more complex because now you have you might have a governing document that says that you have to sell it within this period, or you might have some partners that put more of a an emphasis on selling where some might want to keep. So there, there's a lot of dynamics that go into, into industrial real estate ownership, where you contrast that to just one single investor who goes and buys an, uh, an industrial building. He has virtually unlimited freedom aside from any banking requirements that he might have but he can decide if he wants to sell because he made a profit six months from now he might decide that he just wants to keep it in perpetuity it's but that compared to a large fund with many analysts and many decision makers and many stakeholders and perhaps like like we mentioned that governing contract in there it just becomes infinitely more complex and i think 
it, as you look at those nuances in there, all the way from like an individual investor, all the way up to a sophisticated fund, that's what makes an, an exciting market. And that's what makes their opportunities for, for guys like you and I, who are finally tuned into this market and, and trying to look for opportunities as there's so many things always at play uh, that you just never know what opportunity might come up. The next phone call you take uh, might be an opportunity for a deal that you wouldn't have even expected, uh, but it just underscores the importance that to really make a make, make profit in this business and to make informed and educated decisions, you need to be finely in tuned with the market. Uh, and, and I think having that confidence is what will ultimately dictate whether you are a buyer, a seller, or or a holder. And ultimately, I think, you, you know, you do need to be both. You you need to have attributes or have an openness uh, to, to both because even a forever hold, there are still going to be some situations that warrant a sale. Uh, you know, your intent is to hold it forever and you make decisions holding it forever, but you still may end up selling that property. And that's what, you know, I, I want to talk about. It sounds like we've really covered the ground on objective reasons, right? These are financial numbers-based market-driven approaches that, Hey, you know, the, the, this is the max value of the property. I'm not going to get more. So I'm going to sell. What about the emotional or the psychological side? Because let's talk about your, your sale. You know, how did you mentally make that decision beyond just the numbers, right? It's a, it's a very psychological decision, the fear. Yeah, and and that is the only industrial property that out of my portfolio that I've sold. It was a it was a small a warehouse condo, the second property I ever bought, and we just had a tenant that was coming up for a renewal, and they weren't being uh, uh, open to the idea of a renewal. It had a large commercial cooler in there. We were trying to lease it to to no success. I really just took the approach on it that it, real estate, and I'll say that broadly. Very, a lot of people, for whatever reason, have a hard time losing money on real estate. It could just be that psychological element, but nobody wants to lose money on real estate. They could go and buy a stock for $100 a share. And if it drops to $80 a share, they just they now know that it's $80 a share. And if they want that money, they just sell it for $80. Everybody accepts that. But in real estate, for some reason, there's this psychological impediment that keeps people from saying, okay, well, I bought this property for this, in this case, this one, I think we paid 455 or something for it. It, that was a, it was a while ago. So my memory might be a bit fuzzy, but we ended up selling it for 410. Uh, and then we had to pay a commission on it as well. So we, it, in my mind, it, it was pretty easy to say the building is worth $410,000. Now it's not worth 455 that we paid for it. That's just, the market reality at that time when we did it, it was it was during COVID. Uh, there was a lot of play, a lot of uncertainty. In my mind, I just said you have to treat this the same way you treat a stock. Uh, if if the market is down, that's just the reality of it. And that, if you're in a position where you have to sell, and we were nervous about that one just because of the amount of work we'd have to spend to bring that up to a level, and it was a small property, we didn't want to sink that much uh, more into a property that we we weren't overly committed to anyways. So for us, it just made sense that yes, it's, this is the market now. And I think taking that ego out of it and ego is so destructive in the real estate industry where we all think that we're just brilliant operators. And we think that everything we touch, we can add value to it and we'll have these successful exits and everything will be rosy. And I think that that's the right mentality to have from just an optim optimistic standpoint, but it can also be counterproductive uh, from the sense that if you are in a position where you have a property where you have to sell, and I would say that there's a lot of property owners out there right now that if they bought something last year and they had to sell right now, they're probably in a position where they'd have to take less money. I don't think that there's many scenarios where it'd be otherwise. If they bought it three years ago or five years ago, they're probably making money right now. But the market is so, has so many ebbs and flows in it that you can't see it any any one time that this is the perfect time to sell. So for that one, there were a lot of factors on why we just didn't want to keep going on it. And we removed the ego from it of saying, so we're even backtrack a bit. So I've been a broker since 2005. Uh, so 
bought that one, I believe in 2015. So I had 10 years of experience in the industry. We had already bought another property. That, that's, that's a hit to the ego when everybody in the, in our industry would know that we bought this little condo for 455 and then we had to sell it for 410 when we're supposed to be experts. And we could have said, let's just weather this through. Let's, let's be forever holders, but we wanted to move on to larger properties. And at the end of the day, I don't think anybody really cares. Uh, if somebody has to take a loss on real estate, but it always just goes back to that psychological craziness that nobody yeah. wants to lose money in real estate, but sometimes you just got to put that ego in check and just make the best decision with the information you have available. That's a great example. Cause I never would have thought somebody who's, who's as, uh, you know, accomplished as yourself and, and expertise, you would have had such a a loss or a financial loss, but you know, you learned a lot in experience and in the big picture, it was probably better to sell it uh, just on a size basis, because you're right. That that's a very small property and your attention that would have been required even to make that profitable. Your, your return on your time would have been, you know, 10 bucks an hour mm -hmm. for a tiny little deal. And so it's really refreshing to see that, you know, you can make a mistake, but make small mistakes early because if that was a four million dollar property, you know that's a ten x mistake. That's that's a little mm -hmm. bit different. Or if it's a fourteen million dollar property, right now we're talking some serious equity. At least at least for you and I, uh, fourteen million is a big property. Start small, make your mistakes early, and it really allows you to be comfortable making the smart decisions. Because I guess my point of the psychological thing is, you know, I'm a net seller now right I'm, I'm under contract on two deals that i have serious concerns because i tell other people that i'm selling a, a particular property and they know it and they're familiar with the location like why are you selling that thing is is just going to go up and it's prime location it's great size it's rectangular plot blah 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 and i'm just like well you know what what does the buyer know that i don't they're they're smart sophisticated and they're paying me more because they think it's worth more clearly we're, but maybe it's worth more over a longer time horizon. I don't know, but um, it's a real issue that I think if you're watching this and you may even own a few properties and you're getting some, some offers or brokers telling you to sell, how do you make that decision? Because you're always going to second guess yourself. Even if you get an offer beyond your wildest dreams, you're like, well, Sadesha, you know, maybe it's worth more. Maybe next year it'll be worth more. And, um yeah it, w one thing that i've found helpful both for my own portfolio and when advising others is if you own property and you have and someone makes you an offer to purchase ask yourself if you would buy that property at the same price that they're willing to pay so unless right. there's some external factor like you need the money or there's other, something other at play but all things being equal if you get an offer less than what you think it's worth why would you sell it conversely if you get an offer above what you think it's worth so let's say you bought a property for two million dollars and you get an offer uh very quickly for 2.5 would you buy that exact same property for 2.5 at that point in time and if you would if you believe in it that strongly then don't sell it but if you wouldn't pay 2.5 million for that property i, I think you'd be foolish not to entertain it no absolutely absolutely by the way, this is a good opportunity. I, I feel like this has been on my desk for a while and uh, I wanted to make a thank you, but this is uh, Chad's Chad's coin. I don't know if you can see that there, the glare, but this is his cool token from his uh, industrial real estate. So I got some more stickers and, uh, and a keychain. Thank you very much. But no, the coin is cool. I like the, uh, the reminder and the back here is, you know, good old Dick. But it's a good it's a good reminder. You know, we talk a little bit about stoic uh, philosophy and, and, you know, some of these physical tokens can be reminders of uh, things that are important to us. Yeah, thanks for the for the note on that, too. It's a, that's a, that coin has actually been so good for me. So I wanted to send out just kind of thank you gifts to, to people either for being a guest on my podcast or like little giveaway trinkets. 
and I think that I spent seven hundred dollars on those coins, which sounds like a, a lot. So to think like seven dollars a coin uh, that it takes for the mileage that I've had of people that that have sent it to that have like tagged me in social media and just like I've had people actually reach out and be like, how can I get one of those coins? Oh. Uh, and I usually just send it to them. So I still do have some more, uh, and I actually am planning on doing even an, another one either next year or the year after. And I think I still have fifty of those coins left. So uh, if someone wants, maybe we could do maybe we could do a giveaway on one of those coins right now. We're on if uh, that's right. If, Drop a comment with um with your property, and I I'll say that um I'll do a little analysis uh based on the property address and um you know drop your property if you're interested in having us kind of look at it because one of the things that is my takeaway too is talking to other investors and getting very different opinions of value. Um, not from a broker, not from somebody who who is trying to necessarily get the listing or to get you to sell. They they give you eye popping numbers, but realistically, to your point, let's do the test. Uh, drop the address of a property you want us to look at, and and we'll respond with, uh, yes, this is what I would pay for, it, and this is why, or no, I I wouldn't pay for it, and maybe you'll give a listener a really interesting perspective on the things that we value and what we've been successful at at analyzing you know paying for properties i think that's an awesome idea that's an awesome idea because you're right we we have no skin in the game on anything other than just looking at it uh, objectively as potential investors and i think you and i are the same ron is that i i would look at investments anywhere in north america right now uh, I, I would be a buyer in any single market. I've got a preference. I'd prefer mostly in the Sun Belt, but I, I, there's great value. All someone needs to do is uh, leave leave a property uh, in the in the comments. Not only will you get a free evaluation uh, from from us, we'll send you a, a coin as well. So awesome. it's win win. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, just to recap, is we talked about you know when to decide to sell an industrial property there are objective reasons you know such as such as a, a great cap rate um, a valuation per acre that you know is development type level that which is the highest user right an owner user comes along any price that an owner user offers you is, is pretty much top of the market um and then those are the objective reasons and then there's subjective there's emotional how do you overcome this why does somebody else value my property more than I do? What do what am I missing? And and that's huge. You know, I think in the stock market, for your example, the person on the other side of the trade is nobody. There's no face. You don't know who it is. You don't know their reasoning or how smart they are. But in real estate, it's very personal. It's a it's a buy a single buyer trading with a single seller, and there's a transaction, you know, implicit that I value this more than you do, and it's scary. And so I, you know, I recommend people kind of get over that psychological feeling because it's very natural. I think it happens to everybody to some degree, even when Prologis trades with Blackstone, they're like, crap, what, you know, are we overpaying? <laughs> are, are we over leveraging ourselves? Like, should we be hoarding cash all this? Um, and so you're not alone, but that's the, that's the other major hurdle. So if you can solve those questions, then you'll know the answer to your question of when is it time to sell industrial? Do, do you have, do you want to add anything more, Chad? I think that was very well said. Uh, it, I go back to the beginning comment is look at it that every single property is unique. Your situation is unique as well as the buyer's situation is unique. So there's there's a lot of things that have to be aligned on that. Uh, and that that can be overwhelming at times, but it can also be a great opportunity and it can also just be a great time to reevaluate your portfolio, reevaluate your life situation, reevaluate where you see the market heading. Uh, and sometimes the outcome might be that you hold the property. Sometimes the outcome might be that you have to sell at a loss. And don't be afraid to do that if if that's what the situation calls for. But just just make prudent decisions. I'm, I'm a big believer. You just make the best decision you can with the information you have available. Uh, and to do that, you just have to be on top of the market at all times. Well said, Chad. Well, it was it was great to have you on for this uh, little quick um, video. But uh, if you're still watching now, smash the like button, smash the dislike button. I'll drop links for Chad's channel um, and his website down below. But that's it from us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Ron.